first of all, I thank you, Gina, for the, the, the invitation to this kind of seminars. It's really, I'm flattered to be participating and I need to do well because I know that um, you, you, you had in this series plenty of other seminars talking about not only science, but about the technique itself. So I feel like it's a huge duty to talk about. Uh, I feel a bit more comfortable because it's about biology and I am a biologist and I have been working with um, imaging, I think since four years ago when I joined the LNLS that is the Brazilian synchrotron. Now we are at Sirius, I will talk about this a bit more later. Uh, but, uh, and then now currently I'm a scientist, as Dina mentioned, I'm a scientist at the coherent uh, X-ray imaging scattering and imaging beam line that is called Caterete. And I would like to show to you or to present uh, in this, this talk, uh, some of the examples of how the coherent X-ray imaging can be <clears throat> very useful to, to study the biological system and also to show some examples of, of what we have been doing here in our group. <clears throat> so this is just the, the presentation, <clears throat> sorry, outline. So I, I divided the, 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 the presentation in two main parts. So in the first one is to talk about the coherent imaging to biological sciences, so to give examples from the literature, uh, to show what we can get. And also I will give some examples, as I mentioned before, of the thematic that we are developing in our group. And then in the second part, I will talk briefly about Sirius, uh, an overview, and also the coherent X-ray scattering beam line that I'm part of. And just to show some the technical cap capabilities and also some first uh, results that we got. So then I think we can start. And before talking about coherent imaging, uh, I, I, I like to, to remember the main techniques, imaging techniques that we have been using to study the biological system. So these are very well-known techniques. Uh, they are very powerful. And sometimes what happens is that we will, will end up in a problem is that for these techniques, we need to decide if we want to study large specimens or if we want to go for high resolution. So what we have been doing in our projects, in our research, is to combine these different techniques. Uh, and then we can have information about the different lens scales inside our system. And of course, that all of these techniques that directly or indirectly they will reflect in imaging. Uh, they, they have been evolving a lot, especially with the new synchrotron sources that are, that are coming. Uh, and I would say they, they are evolving to give the information of these different length scales. And I would say that one of the evolutions that we have, especially in the X-ray based techniques is the coherent X-ray imaging. So, uh, I guess you may, I think you, you heard a lot about all the different configurations of coherent imaging that we can, that we can perform. Uh, but for biology, there are, uh, I would say, three main, uh, three main setups that are more suitable. So they are the plane wave, the tychography, and the holography. Um, so depending, so which setup to use, it will depend on the, the, the question that you want to answer. So this, or the size of your sample, the resolution that you want to reach. So in plane wave, we have the, the restriction of having a sample that is smaller than the beam. So then we over illuminate our sample. We can combine with tomography as well. Uh, the, the dose that the sample, uh, that the sample will receive is much lower compared to, to, for example, tychography. But on the other hand, tychography allows us to study extended specimens because we are going to scan the sample. So 
uh, in some cases, like for tissue studies, it, it may be more suitable. And there is holography as well, that it's a very promising technique uh, to study tissues as well. But in this presentation, I would like to focus in plane wave and tychography, that it's uh, the, the work that we have been developing uh, over here. Uh, so then just a few properties, or I would say advantage to use the, the coherent imaging to recover the, the, the information about, about the biological specimens. So why? Why to use this technique? So because it allows us to study the non-crystalline targets, that it's mainly uh, all of the targets, that um, most of the targets that we have in biological systems we have the opportunity to do the experiments with the sample that can be fixated or non-fixated. Uh, we can take advantage of the natural contrast to recover the cellular and also intracellular uh, information. So in terms of volume, especially when we combine with, um, with tomography. And we can also recover the electron density information. So this is the, I think is one of the, most interesting features because you can assign the different uh, uh, structures that you have, for example, inside of your cell based on the electron density. So these are uh, nice experiments, uh, very well known from the literature uh, for, single, for single cells or for isolated cells. So for example, it has been done in algae in uh, parasites, this is canine parasite. Uh, also to, you can see in yeast, you can see this for bacteria as well. And also not only to look to the cell, but then you can attack uh, a specific structure that you are interested inside of the cell. So this is a, an example of a mitochondria. Uh, this is, I think, I don't remember if this is human or mouse mitochondria. So I think this was one of the best resolution that they managed to achieve using coherent X-ray imaging. So then you can try to define the, the internal structures, but of course, uh, here we are limited by resolution. But then uh, not only talking about isolated cells or, or uh, single cells, we, we are also interested to study tissues. So we want to understand how is the behavior or the role of uh, the cell or some, some process that is going to happen in situ. So this is a, there, there are some setups of coherent X-ray imaging that are very nice to study the soft tissues. So you can not only look inside of the, the, uh, the intracellular structures, but you can, for example, map more uh, porous networks. And then you can recover the large volume information and still reach uh, high resolutions of down to 10 or 20 nanometers for biological imaging. So here is an example. This, is, this was one of the first ones of tychography in silk fiber, so where they explore the, 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 the effect of the humidity in the pore space of the silk. So it was nice because it was one of the first experiments that involved um, uh, some technical development to control the humidity and to look uh, these, these, these changes along the experiment. And then there is a very classic one that is this from tychography from CSACS as well from mouse brain tissue, where they managed to do all the cryo preparation and measurement and to look into the neurons uh, with high resolution. So to identify organelles and to identify also the connections between the, the, the neurons. And once this was done, then it was like a, a trigger to, to explore some scientific cases related to disease. So for example, this one uh, where we have the, the Parkinson human brain that was also done at CSACS, uh, where again, we can explore all the neuronal connections and try to understand a bit more the, the physiology of the disease. 
but not, not only for human tissue, but also for plants, that it's uh, basically all of the cells in the plant, they are in tissue. So here it's really nice because this is a, a tychography experiment where they wanted to understand the interaction of the bacteria in the root of Arabidopsis thaliano, that it's a classical model for plants. So then you can identify the different cellular types when you do segmentation, but also you can go inside and really see the bacteria. So this is, this is really promising as well. So, but we, we know, or maybe you should know that uh, there are some key points or bottlenecks in the, in the whole workflow for the 60, for the coherent X-ray scattering and imaging experiments that it involves the sample preparation. Since we need to prepare very small uh, samples, we are more or less limited to what the, the, the equip equipments can provide to us. Also, there is a, a big concern, and this is very well known, uh, in, in radiation damage that will prevent the, the high resolution that we may achieve. So, for this, uh, you can see all the biological community in the synchrotrons trying to get rid of this problem by working with equipments that are commonly used in electron microscopy. So plant freezer, the cryostat, and the high pressure freezing. But also you need to collect this data under uh, in, in, in special conditions. So then the synchrotrons are building, they are investing to build uh, sample environments that are cryogenic or somehow will preserve uh, the sample. And also a very important uh, part of this workflow is the image reconstruction and data analysis. So more and more we are producing large amount of data and we need to have even more uh, powerful machines to do so. And so these are the, the critical points, but I guess we are tackling it well, and I will show later how we are going to tackle this as well here at, at, uh, at our beam line or at Sirius in general. So now uh, I would like to give you two examples about the, the thematic that we have been developing here in our group, in our group at Caterete, uh, that it's based in plant science. So in this thematic, we would like to understand how is it the, the biomass deconstruction, because we have some biotechnological interest on, on it. So why? Because in Brazil, we produce a lot of sugarcane and we use mainly to produce ethanol. And with this high production and usage of the, the sugarcane, we generate as well a lot of waste. So what we think is that what we know is that with this waste, we can use to generate even more ethanol, that what we call uh, second generation ethanol. But to, to do this process to extract and to get to the second generation ethanol, there is a long way. Uh, and we need to try to isolate somehow the, the, the cellulose fraction of this biomass. So the biomass is basically the plant cell wall uh, that it's dry. And then what we need to do is to get rid of all of the other stuff that you have in the cell wall and keep only the cellulose. And then the cellulose, we will submit to enzymatic hydrolysis that will generate the glucose. And the glucose is going to be the raw material for the fermentation to generate more ethanol. But then one of these trashes that we need to remove from the sugar cane is the lignin. The lignin has a very important uh, role uh, in the physiology of the plant that is to confer stiffness, to protect from pathogens. But when you think about the application, this is really uh, a bottleneck because this is going to confer the recalcitrance for the material. So we want to get rid of the lignin somehow. And there are different uh, approaches to do this. And one of them, for example, is when you submit this material, this biomass to physical or chemical pretreatments and you remove somehow the lignin. And then there are different processes that are already described in the literature that are used in the, the large scale. 
but always they have been uh, optimized based on functional studies, but uh, there is a lack on the structural studies to understand what are really the, the, the modifications that the, the pretreatment is introducing in the nanoscale of the material. So we wanted to understand that to try to see if we could improve the, the, this process of extraction that it's currently very expensive. So to do so, uh, we, we decided to go for the, exp the experiment of CDI, the plane wave CDI. So this experiment was done uh, at ID Tambin Line at ESRF in France. I did my, uh, it was the project that I developed during, developed the, during my, during my uh, postdoc there. So this is a very nice um, uh, technique because as I, I, I explained it briefly, uh, this is, you need to over illuminate your sample. The dose is going to be not so high compared to the other setups. And also it's insensitive to the, the when you have any sample drift uh, or oscillation. Uh, this technique, since you are over illuminating your sample, you're not so sensitive to this kind of, of changes. So then you can still reconstruct a high resolution 2D or the 3D image. So how did we do to, to how did we proceed with this, this experiment? So we took here, I'm just put to my, uh, so here we, we wanted to study the natural sugar cane for the natural baguettes of sugar cane uh, and compare to one sugar cane that was submitted to hydrothermal pretreatment. So what we, we did, we went to the cryo microtome. So we did very thin slices and we generated a very large area sample, although it's very thin, but then we needed to isolate another very small area inside of this slice. So then using laser microdissection, we were able to cut these fragments of the, the cell wall, that it's basically the, the, the baggies. And we deposited this on silicon nitride membranes that is the substrate for the, the X-ray experiment. And then we follow the workflow for data collection in tomographic mode then reconstructing the 3D grid in the reciprocal space. That was the input for the phase retrieval and image reconstruction. So in the end, what we have is this, here I'm showing the, is the comparison between one particle of natural and treated uh, sample. So here is just a single slice of the, the tomogram that we reconstructed and here on the top, I'm comparing to the, the electron microscopy that we did from the same particle. And then uh, when we look to the, to the slice or even when we look into the surface of the reconstructed image, we can see that we have some changes between the particles. But I would say that the really nice part of the, the, the tomographic study, especially when we do in this configuration, is that we can go uh, deep or, or that, that I mean that we go underneath this, this shell and we can see, for example, all the porous network. And why this is interesting? Because when we understand the, 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 the modifications in the pore network, it allows us also to perform simulations and to better understand what is going to be the permeability of the fluids inside of this particle. So, when we look, we can see that we have a fibrillar disruption. So the fibers that we use it to see now we, we cannot see anymore. And we can see that we have a porous uh, network modification. But of course, we cannot do this based in a single particle, in a single fragment of cell wall. So then here I'm showing five from each, the natural and the, the treated one. And when we went deep into the porosity analysis, we could see that in fact, this pretreatment uh, generates a 20% en enhancement in the porosity and a twofold increase in the surface area. So, and then we can also use this after we go for the image analysis, we can also simulate, for example, permeability. And what we realize is that this process it still have uh, some some it still has some 
some place for improvement because the the permeability increase was really was really really weak so so that's i guess what i want to show that's the importance to show to to do this kind of experiments and to explore and how we can improve the the pretreatment process so it's kind that we are giving a feedback to the people that are really exploring this area of the pretreatments and then we say okay maybe we should do some modification because i mean this is what you are getting only so that's why the the process is so expensive but you are not get anything uh, better than 20 percent enhancement in the in the porosity so in this experiment finally we in these particles we have it we had a third to four nanometers 3d resolution we managed to uh, get all to map all the porous network inside of these particles and in this case this case specifically we were limited to the particle size because we had a very small beam so it was a 10 microns beam so basically we needed to look to particles smaller than that so this is a bottleneck but i guess this is, i will talk later when i talk about larger beams uh, and then the improvements that the plane wave can bring for the biological samples. Uh, then a second example that I would like to give. So coming back to the, to the bottleneck that is the lignin, another way of getting rid of these, this polymer is using genetic manipulation. So when we do, when we use genetic manipulation, we basically, we basically, um, are, we are going to basically mutate the ligning pathway deposition. So you can silence genes, genes that are responsible for the ligning production and therefore the ligning deposition on the plant. And by doing so, you have a more uh, digestible plant thinking about the further steps. So usually these, you have several enzymes in the, in the pathway that can be silenced or mutated. And usually these experiments, these tests, they are done in Arabidopsis thaliana, that it's a model plant. And then after you validate this in a, in a simple model, then you go, for example, for the sugar cane or starch or whatever. So here in this case we look at for a mutant that uh, it's actually the enzyme c4h that it's responsible for the ligning deposition and what we would like to actually what they saw already the 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 plant the plant group what they realized is, is that when they mutated this enzyme they Indeed, they get rid of the recalcitrance of the plant, but what they realize is that the, the plant, they were suffering from dwarfism. So they were not growing and because they were not stiff enough. So they, they tend to bend and by bending, the, bending the, the plant was dying. And this is because the plant, the, the plant cell wall is much thinner than it was in the native plants. So then you need to balance that, uh, how, how much does it cost to decrease the lignin, but then to still have a viable uh, plant. So in this sense, we wanted to go into the structural part of these, this work. And we started a collaboration with the group dedicated to, to, the, to, this, to the plant science and to try to understand what is the thickness and what are the morphological changes that you are going to observe when you have the lack of ligning deposition in the cells. So to do this kind of investigation, we went then for tychography experiments. So this experiment was done at C. Sachs Bin Line at PSI in Switzerland. So the great advantage of this technique, as I mentioned before, is the ability to scan uh, a, a large volume sample. So you are not limited by the bean size anymore. Uh, you have some problems with uh, radiation damage because the dose is going to be very high. But in other hand, in, on the other hand, we can combine this with cryogenic capabilities to try to decrease or to avoid the damage. So <clears throat> how did we proceed? So we take the Arabidopsis thaliana wild type and the mutant. Um, 
we collected a fragment of what we call the petiole. So is this region here to the close to the leaf. And then we did a similar uh, a preparation that is pretty much similar to the to the um, uh, transmission electron microscopy. So we did a chemical fixation and resin imbibition. And then uh, instead of generating the very thin slices for as we do for the electron microscopy, what we did, we take this block of sample and we did the FIB-SM. So with the FIB, we generated a piler of about more or less five microns diameter and in height that we took to the beam line. And then we did the, the, the tychography in tomographic mode. So to do this experiment, since we had a large volume uh, sample, we know that radiation damage was going to be an issue. So we took advantage of the, the, the cryogenic instrument that they have there at the beam line, that is the Omni. And we did all the, the, all the experiments using this, this instrument to prevent the radiation damage. So then, uh, so first we, we reconstructed the, the, the tomograms to compare the wild type and the, the mutant. And when we look already to the tomograms, we can see that are some, it seems to have some similar dissimilarities between the, the, two, the two samples. Uh, you can see that in the mutant, you have some thinning of the, the cell. But to be sure about that, of course, that we need to analyze this image. So then what we did was to extract the, the cellular types that we're interested into. And by doing so, we also separate the different cellular compartments. So in our case, it was the cellular lumen, that it's the yellow one, and the cell wall. So by doing this kind of separation, we can perform, for example, thickness analysis to understand the structure of the cell wall, for instance. So uh, when we usually in, in plant science, we are very based on 2D images. So when you look to, uh, to the image, you believe that the, the morphology and the thickness of the cell wall is going to be always like constant or homogeneous. And when you do this kind of analysis in 3D, like I'm showing here, you can see that this is a very heterogeneous structure. So then with the, the data that we have, we can extract the quantitative data. So to see the, 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 the variation in the thickness, and not only this, what we were able to do is to establish a relationship between the thickness or the diameter of the lumen for the thickness uh, of the cell wall. And with this, we can establish a ratio to calculate how thick the cell wall needs to be so that the, the, the implosion or the cell wall, the, 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 plant, the, uh, the plant will not die. So it, it will not implode and then die. So this, is, was, this was one of the first data uh, or results that we have from our thematic. This is published. And it gave a lot of perspective of what we can do in plant science. So it allows to separate different compartments. Uh, and then you can extract all the quantitative information. In our case, we could define these parameters for the implosion, for the resistance of the cell wall, to understand which cellular uh, type in the plant is more affected. And in this experiment, we reach uh, 140 nanometers resolution that was sufficient uh, to observe all these heterogeneities uh, in the cell wall, for example, and in the mutant plant. So I guess now we, we already have other projects in mind where we can explore these, all these capabilities, this quantitative capability that echography or plane wave CDI can offer for plant science. So now I think I move on to the second part that is to talk a, a bit about our synchrotron light source. So I will first give an overview. So this is Sirius. Uh, so this is the, the fourth generation Brazilian synchrotron light source that we have now. Uh, 
uh, I don't know if you were aware, maybe you were, we had uh, uh, the, the old one that we call, oops, sorry, that we call the, the, the UVX that operated since uh, 1997 until 2018. So if you compare, I mean, it was, uh, it was very small compared to what we have at, at Sirius today. Uh, so now we are fully dedicated to Sirius, everybody, everybody moved it. They, we are, so now I can show you uh, the beam lines and the status that we are. So now talking about the beam lines, uh, these ones that I'm showing are the beam lines that are going to be built uh, in what we call the first phase. So then you have uh, seven of them. So uh, we have, for example, the, the, the nanoprobe beam line, catheter that it's the coherent X-ray beam line, EMA, that is the extreme conditions, diffraction, and an X spectroscopy beam line under commissioning. So we are all at uh, what we call technical commissioning. And we have Manaka, that is the protein crystallography beam line that it's already receiving, receiving users. So it started officially, I think the inauguration was now in October. So we are, they are operating like they are up and running and we are on commissioning phase. So of course that then I will talk a bit more about the, the coherent, uh, the coherent X-ray scattering and imaging that it's the catheter beam line. Uh, that is the group that I, that I work with. So this beam line is dedicated, is, is dedicated to coherent X-ray imaging. So in the first, in the first uh, setup, we are going to be dedicated to plane wave CDI, and later we will implement tychography and Bragg CDI. We will also be dedicated, we are also dedicated to uh, XPCS, to probe dynamics of the systems uh, using, uh, taking advantage of the coherence property of the, the beam. And also, um, uh, we will keep doing SACs, uh, time resolved SACs, and small angle X ray scattering, uh, ultra small angle X ray scattering. So soon we will have at Sirius the, the, the SAC, a dedicated beam line for SACs, but meanwhile, we are going to do all the modalities inside, inside SACs. Um, and then, of course, that uh, this since this presentation is dedicated to 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 imaging, I will explore a bit more about the beamline properties dedicated to to imaging. So, we will be able to work. We are able to work in a wide range of of energy. Uh, so, at three kV, we may reach the ten to the minus thirteen photons per second. Uh, we can also have a very large beam that uh, will enable us, for example, to study large, larger specimens and for bio, for example, uh, larger uh, tissue fragments. Uh, since we have the, this long tunnel that I showed before, we'll be able to work up to 30 meters that we will enable the different experiments that I mentioned before. But also we will have a large detector area that it's uh, based on Medipix developed here in house that is going to be a 3000 pixels area. And since so uh, why this is important, I mean, since we are basically, basically, basically limited by the higher scattering angle, I mean, the larger the detector we have to collect all this information and the sample to detector larger large sample to detector distance, the better. So that's why we, we invested a lot in have, on having these, these um, very long uh, um, range on the sample to detector distance, as well in the, on the size of the detector. And then this is just to show a picture of how the end station looks like. So we have the beam coming from here. We have in the sample here, in the sample environment, we have this, the Arinax that is an inline microscope. So it's like you are looking in the same direction as the beam is coming. And this allows us to, for example, to look into the sample, to align, it, to align the sample and so on. 
uh, in this sample, in this, this uh, sample stage, we have also some interferometers that will help us uh, to monitor any uh, sample stage uh, oscillation that might be, that might prevent the, the image reconstruction, for example, or to obtain high resolution. So then we know by how much we are, the, the sample is moving. And also on the top of the, the stack of stages that uh, includes the rotation as well, because we will work in tomographic mode, uh, we have a very versatile sample holder. So we can put, uh, it can host uh, silicon nitride membranes, uh, capillaries, so we can work with powder, with liquids, and uh, eventually in the future, we, we are developing now also to work with the gases to study uh, in, situ, in situ reactions. So this we put inside of, a, let's say, enclosure that we call. Uh, this is going to be, uh, the humidity is going to be controlled inside because we are going to work, it's not showing up here, but we have the analyx that it's a cryo stream that works with helium at uh, uh, liquid nitrogen temperatures uh, to do the cryo experiments for the biology. So we have everything in a compact, compact setup. And then in terms of science, uh, I, I already started saying before, but uh, also it's not only about biosciences, but also material sciences. So uh, study tissues, to study uh, cells as well, but also to study, for example, catalysts and to understand the hierarchical structures uh, uh, of these, that these, uh, the hierarchical structures inside of these thematics. So then we also have our publications that although it was not coming from the bean line because we just started to have the first uh, results of the commissioning, but it was the science that we have been developing along with all of these years and in using other synchrotrons. So there was the one in plant science that I showed you before, but there is also one in, um, in catalysis. So this is from my colleagues from the group where they wanted to correlate the hysteresis uh, to the strain looking to the single nanoparticle so they did Bragg CDI in, in operando mode and they reached 15 nanometers resolution. This is the, it's very new, this work that came out and it's a, um, a collaboration with APS. And then I come back uh, to that uh, slide of bottlenecks of uh, coherent X-ray imaging. And I would like to just to highlight how we are, we are looking to, to tackle all of these issues. So, for example, in terms of sample preparation and radiation damage, we are purchasing, we are preparing a cryogeny lab that is going to be close to the beam line, where we are going to have the, the basic equipment to start to work, for example, in cryo conditions in the case of the bioscience and soft materials as well. And in terms of image reconstruction and data analysis, I mentioned the power, the powerful machines that we, we, we will need, but also we need uh, powerful minds to, to, to know how to, to optimize, how to treat such uh, large volume data, how to process and how to analyze. So for this, we have a dedicated uh, team at LNLS that it's the scientific computing group. So they are fully dedicated to improvements in image reconstruction, to storage and to image analysis as well, to try to develop programs and uh, free, uh, our own free softwares to do this, all the, the, the workflow. So I guess we are on the way to try to, to, to solve these, these issues. And I believe that it's like any other place, all the, the other synchrotrons are doing right now because these are really big concerns. <clears throat> and then just to show some first imaging results that we got from the beam line. So we started with some patterns. So this is the image to the image of the coherent scattering of a two microns pinhole. 
So we had the two microns, the five microns pinhole. Then we went for the Siemens star. So then we are doing several, we are using these standards also to do the, the, the technical commissioning, but also, and then we, before we start the, the scientific commissioning, uh, this is, was the, the first, this is the, the grid that it's a pattern as well. <clears throat> Sorry, that is the pattern as well. But to start with, we could reconstruct the 2D image and we reached the 13 nanometers pixel size. So we were working at 10 keV at uh, 12 meters distance. So this was the first image reconstruction that we got. And <clears throat> now we are looking forward to perform the 3D experiments and to reconstruct. So, so this is what we have been doing uh, these last weeks. And then just to finish, uh, so what I would like to, to highlight from all of this that I, that I show is that uh, there is the, the, the synchrotron, the, the coherent X-ray imaging at the synchrotron provides the high energy photons and the high spatial resolution that we need to visualize uh, many structures in biosystem. So it's a complementary technique to electron and optical microscopy, as I showed before, that have been evolving a lot along these years. Uh, it's a very nice technique because it has the, it, it offers the opportunity to study non-crystalline samples non-fixated, so we can study the cells or the tissues in the cl closest to the natural, in the, the native state. Um, we can still study, depending on the configuration, we can study large specimens and still uh, reach a few nanometers resolution. And we have all the quantitative data based on electron density that we can extract. And it's nice to, to highlight that we have some challenges, some bottlenecks that it's in sample prepara preparation, radiation damage, and the large volume data that we need to process. But I guess we are all working on that. So we, at Sirius, uh, we, we are very folks focused on offering the user the, the entire workflow, so the support for the, uh, for the whole workflow of uh, coherent uh, X-ray imaging. So since the sample preparation up to the image analysis, because we know how, how this is not so, so trivial for the users. So we are working hard on that and we are implementing already. So with this, uh, just to, to say that we are, going, we are organizing the SAS uh, the small angle, uh, angle scattering conference that is going to be, it was supposed to be in 2021. Now it's going to be in 2022 due to the pandemic. So just for you to have a look on the website, we already have some, some information. So if you want to, to participate, we don't know if it's going to be remote yet or, or if it's going to be on site, but in any case. And then I would like to thank so I mainly the group. So at LNLS, there is the Caterete group that uh, we have. So it's Tiago and João that they are the technicians for the beam line. Floria Meno that is the leader of the group. So Alini that is the scientist dedicated to XPCS. Luisa is the student. Paloma is working on catalysis. So she uses all the techniques that we can all the experiments that we can do, uh, and she's a postdoc. Uh, there is Paulo as well, that it's a, a postdoc, and Laís, that it's a student working, she's a biologist, so she's working with me to try to develop all this methodological part to, to imaging of a biosystem. And also there is all the engineering computation groups that are, I mean, they are uh, fundamental to make all of these this work and also the collaborators from uh, all the work that we did in th these last four years. So there is people from there are people from Brazil there that are from PSI and ESRF. So and thank to the funding agencies. So if you have any, if you want to contact me, I put my mail over here. So feel free. And I thank you for your attention. And then I open if you want to discuss or if you have any questions. 
Thank you so much, Carla, for this uh, talk. Uh, extremely interesting from the scientific and the technical part. Uh, so now the session is open for questions. You can either write them in a common chat and I can read them loud, or you can raise your hand. Uh, I will have a look at the list of participants and I will be happy to give you, or you can unmute yourself. Uh, maybe I will start so I break the ice. Um, I have a question about your uh, uh, lignin uh, decrease. So you were saying that um, you have uh, been able to, uh, with the genetic manipulation, to reduce the lignin content by 60%, if, I, if I'm... Uh, so you need to, to find the balance between the plant's strength and you know, the decrease of lignin to, uh, to reduce, to improve the industrial process. But how, what is the effect, the impact of this decrease on the industrial effect? Is this effective? Is this enough? for the, for the um, extra alcohol production, basically. You mean- Reduction of lignin of 60%, does he have a strong impact on the capability of having a second, the second stage of the alcohol production? Yeah, basically, yes, yes. I think I, I let me see if I got your question. Uh, yes, so if you, maybe, is it okay if I share my screen again? Absolutely, yes. So I will just put it here because then I can, maybe I could do without, but uh, why not to come back just a sec. Um, so, so basically when you, if I understood well your question, but basically when you remove the, the lignin, what you are doing is basically you are jumping already to maybe the other slide. What happens when you remove here the lignin, you are jumping already to this step here. So it's where you have, uh, let's say, more exposed cellulose, so you don't need to do any treatment or chemical treatment. Because what happens is that when you, when you have this intermediate uh, step of chemical or physical treatment, sometimes you have some subproducts that might be very bad for this step of high enzymatic hydrolysis. So yes, you remove the lignin, but then you have a lot of uh, secondary uh, products that might prevent to go on. So if you can manage somehow to remove or to decrease the lignin content and then uh, you expose the cellulose or you have, the, let's say you have the cellulose more pure, then you can jump already to this step here without having any bioproducts. So in this sense, uh, this, this is why this is, very, uh, this is very important. I mean, if we manage to get to, uh, actually there are some, uh, spec, uh, some, some um, I think it was in sugarcane, they managed to find some mutations, some proper mutations that you can maintain both. So the plant is still stiff, so it will grow and you still have the decrease, even with the decrease of the, the, the lignin. So then you have a higher dig digestibility. So I don't know if I answer your question more or less. Yes. Uh, there is a question from Ian Robinson. Please Ian, you can unmute, yeah. Hi, and thank you for the talk. I, I missed the beginning, but I, I caught the uh, the end part of the talk and the results from Sirius I was most interested in. Um, you showed diffraction from a two micron and a five micron uh, pinhole. Um, and the exactly. two micron looked correct, but the five micron looked like it was, uh, the, there was not much uh, fringe visibility. And so I'm just wondering if, uh, uh, if you've been able to to figure out what what has gone wrong with that one, this one here, yes. Yes, yeah, this one. So basically, this now we are uh, in the I think in the last week it was, we decided to change a bit the energy and then we, actually we are having what happens is that now we are dealing with the being instability problems, so okay. that's why we are just doing for now tests in two D. And actually this was before we could track these instabilities. So for now, what we have been doing since we know, we know that they exist and we know when they are going to happen. So now we are playing more with these leads 
to try to decrease the the bean size and try to cut as much uh, to cut as much as we can and to really have only the coherent bean in this spot so here i didn't put but now we redid this the the same experiment with the bean hole uh, with the with these let's say more the more coherent bean and then indeed you can really see the difference in the fringes so yeah indeed so the 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 decrease in the bean size to catch only the the coherent fraction it was the the it was i mean it was what solved our problem yeah but uh, you can also use this as a, a feedback to the machine to to help debug stability type uh, questions yeah so, yeah know. that's true actually this is exactly what we have been doing now so we are doing now so actually it's a bit crazy because we are doing machine commissioning together with uh, being line commissioning but so then during the night so they are trying to switch off some uh, some feedback correctors just to see if they can track where these oscillations are coming from so this is really nice because we are really working together to try to to tackle this this problem because otherwise we cannot go for the 3d okay thank you there was a question also a request for a question from judith yeah uh, yeah. From our Sikaton, very nice talk. Thank you uh, very much, Carla, uh, very clear. I have two um, questions on the uh, technical side. First is that you mentioned that you, you introduced some, uh, some interferometers in order to know which, uh, which are the movements. Are you, are you uh, using those interferometers as a feedback to steer the beam or to, uh, to, to change the position of the sample, or you are just uh, using them for diagnostics? This is uh, one question. And then second question is about the helium chamber. Helium is very volatile, so, uh, so in, in theory, you would need a, uh, actually a vacuum chamber in order to enclose the, uh, the helium without any escapes. And taking into account that helium is quite rare, do you, how do you foresee to recover the helium if you recover it at all? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So for, for the, the first question, sorry, I forgot. Uh, so for the first question, it was about, sorry. It, it was, I, I was about using the interferometers only as, ah, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. as a diagnostics. Yeah, so yeah, basically now what we, actually we, we purchased it and we projected the, the sample environment to, to have this interferometric system. Uh, thinking about the typography experiments that we 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 look that we are thinking to do, so that's why we we put. So for now, we we know that we could use uh, eventually for the plane wave experiments and so on. But we are thinking more for the sample stage oscillations for the typography experiments. So then we can recover the 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 stage, the sample stage position, and somehow use it as an input for the, for the reconstruction algorithm. So this is how we are planning to use this. And then for, for the second question about the, 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 the chamber, actually, this is the, 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 the environment, the enclosure is not going to be uh, actually full of helium. We have the analytics. That's one of, of the advantage of working with this cryo stream with helium is that it's very, very low flow rate. So then, I mean, you don't need uh, an exhaustion system because it's going to, to just dissipate here inside of the chamber. And then we are also going to have dry air over here. So we already did some, some tests. And I mean, the flow rate that we need to keep the sample frozen is very, very low. So then, I mean, uh, at least we discussed it with the, the, the group of safety to, I mean, about the concerns of the ELU and so on. Uh, but then at the flow rates and the amounts that we are using, uh, and uh, it's kind of, it's dissipating by itself. So they, they don't think this is a problem. So for now we will use like this. And then if somehow we, we need to use a higher flow rate or uh, we need to change the setup, then we will go for the exhaustion and so on. But for now we, we don't need it. I, I hope I, I answered your question. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. We have a question from Pablo, who writes, um, 
what is the best resolution you achieved in the radiosensitive samples with CDI and with tachography? Okay, so in the, the experiments that I did, the one from uh, ID10 that I did at ESR, ESRF in plane wave, so we reached 30 to 40 nanometers resolution in 3D in that particles that I showed. And for the tachography measurement, we reach uh, 140 nanometers in 3D. I actually had a small question about this 140 nanometer. What was the limit of this tachography? It's in, it's, uh, this is the experiment you did in Omni. What, yeah, what yeah. You mean the limiting the resolution? Yeah. What was uh, the main determining factor you, you remember? Uh, in my case, it was radiation damage. <laughs> so, yeah. So, basically, when you are doing the reconstruction, you can see that the, even though you have, it was not scattering too much because, I mean, these this, this type of samples, they don't scatter too much. But it's not only the weak, I think the most limited factor was the radiation damage and not the weak scattering. So basically, I guess this was the limitation. Otherwise, for the, the calculated, I think it was about 50 nanometers resolution that we would reach based on the theoretical calculation. Okay, so actually Manuel is having a question for you, Manuel Bizar. Hi, Carla. Hello. Very nice presentation. Thank uh, you. I had a very quick question. I may have missed it. When when do you plan to start with user operation in in the C, in the CDI beamline and also for the tachography beamline, which I forgot the names, Caterete and Kanau? Mm. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So basically, we from what we, the last news that we we heard, we may start in the first semester of next year. Uh, but I guess we will start with a few users of SACS because here we have a large community of SACS and they are without beam line. So uh, since the SACS beam line will be ready later, maybe by the second semester of, ne of next year or maybe 2022, we will give support to the SACS users as well. So we will start uh, with uh, SACS. Uh, we will keep doing then the I mean, it's hard to, there is no scientific and technical commission, they are everything together. So we will commission a bit more, especially for the 3D, that it's more, more tricky because I mean, the being instabilities and so on. So we are trying to solve this while we, we have a few users from SAC. So I guess by the end of next semester and then officially it would be second semester of 2021. Okay, thank you. Very exciting to get this nice streamline yeah. online. Uh, next question is from Virginie. I, it's, it's 305, but I go on. I see that there are still many people in, uh, online. So, uh, I mean, this session is open to, to discussion at, at, uh, until it lasts, basically. So Virginie asks, um, is there any perspective about developing spectrotypography uh, for element mm -hmm. sensitivity? Yeah, so this is something that we, actually we have a, um, a beam line that it's Carnauba, that is the, the nanoprobe beam line. They are going to be more dedicated to spectroscopy. So probably uh, they will start to do, they will be the first ones to do this type of experiments. We think about doing, we already thought about doing this, but it's going to be on the long term. So then it's not going to be, be Caterete in the, the first, in the first uh, period, but it's going to be Carnauba being line. So then we will have these, these available at Sirius. And then there is a, a small addition to this question. You, you were talking about uh, tachography and Brack CDI. What about Brack tachography? And <laughs> yeah, beam lines or any plot a series. Uh, I guess this is going to be more or less like uh, once we 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 implement both of them. I guess it's going to be more or less. Uh, it will depend on the demand, of, of course. I mean. For now, thinking about imaging, we, we don't have too many users. So we have our science, we know some people, but uh, I mean, it's not so well diffused. But I guess uh, once we implement, for example, 
Plane wave and typography and the brag, we will start. I mean, to generate or to create this community, and I'm pretty sure this this demand. We we know actually some some people from Sirius some, from uh, Carnauba that they are uh, brag tyco uh, at Max. So I guess this is something that is going to come. It will come uh, in any case, and we will need people to to develop. But I guess this is something that I mean, it's it's going to be compulsory. Yeah, I had I have a similar question about the setup you uh, you plan to do for uh, Bragg CDI. I mean, you are you have a very specific setup for small angle scattering with this long tube and the detector. Uh, so, is there any specific adaptation that you are planning for Bragg CDI? Yes, actually is not, uh, I should have put it the other way around picture. So it's like you are looking when the beam is coming into the, into the, the hutch, but I guess I didn't put any picture here, but uh, we have outside of the chamber where we have the, the, the big detector, we have here in the same uh, stone that we have the sample, the sample environment, we also have a Pilatus detector. So for now, we will start with the, the Pilatus. So this Pilatus is under, it's uh, in a support where you have all the degrees of freedom. So you can rotate, you can translate and do whatever you want. And then soon, I mean, the, the Pilatus is just for the beginning. And then uh, we will have a small chip, uh, a small module of uh, Medipix as well. So we have the big one inside of the tunnel. And then we are going to have a small one outside in the same position of the Pilatus that is going to be dedicated to, to diffraction experiments. So it's, it's completely independent uh, setup. Okay. Um, are there more questions from the audience? Uh, you can write them in the chat, you can raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask. Um, Hello, hello, I have a question. Yes, please, Anna. Uh, hello, Carla. Hello. Um, um, I would like to know if you guys already have numbers for the coherence. I mean, the longitudinal and transverse coherence. Uh, hi, Anna. Hello. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, we didn't, di we didn't do this characterization yet, actually. Now, one of the things that we, I don't know if we are going to do by the end of this year, but when we start next year, is going to be all of these characterizations. So it's the energy uh, uh, calibration, the, the coherence determination, and all of this, this experiments. So for now, we are, we are looking into the images that we are, we are generated, so the pinholes, and then we see the fringes. And we, we are trying to optimize based on images, but we, we didn't do yet the, the, the proper characterization. So mm -hmm. this I, we should do uh, by the beginning, I think by the beginning mm -hmm. of next year. Do you know how you are going to determine the coherence or for now um, it's... No, we are still we st we are still discussing how we are going to do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is an open if you if you by the way have any suggestion. We have some some clues, but we didn't like said it's going to be this. So if you mm -hmm. have anything to 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 like to share, then it's well it's well it's welcome. Okay. Um, Carla, I've seen uh, in your uh, uh, transparencies you were they are quite heavy on coherence the plans uh, for this beam line. Uh, I think that in the groups there are many people involved already in experiment at other facilities. Um, so, the, what is the uh, the strategy of the of the team? I mean, you are now commissioning, then you will go in operation. I suppose there will be first users, maybe commissioning users. What is the team strategy to um, you know exploit at best these capabilities of the beam line and the coherence properties of Sirius? We have already plans for this. Yeah, so then I guess with this thematic uh, that we that we started on uh, um, on the plant side and also in the catalysis part, in, in plant science I I would say that we I, we are not much. So now we are, for example, to 
to be able to tackle the, the, the commissioning and also the scientific part, we, we are trying to get a, a, a postdoc that is going to be dedicated to continue this project on plants. So then we can move on with all these, not only the scientific part, but to help as well for the development of the techniques of how to prepare and how to measure and so on. So for this, we will have a postdoc. For the, the catalysis part, the material science part, we also got interesting results. So we have much more, now we have much more ideas of what to do and how to, to move. So we have this, this project, yes, we have more people involved in the lab. So we have uh, experts in, in catalysis. And also we have postdocs already working on this. So I guess this is going to be more or less the way we will follow with these, these two main thematics from the group. Uh, we are trying to bring other, for example, in biological sciences, not on only plant sciences, but I have a strong collaboration from the Hart Institute here from the university. So there are some, some nice projects that they would like to be more involved. In. So I guess it's going to be this, some collaborations, they are going to start to, I mean, to, to just be very strong. Uh, but for now, at least these two main thematics we know that we have and the, the, we have the, 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 the scientists, postdocs that are, are keeping this working while we do, let's say, while we do the commissioning. Dina? I'm afraid Dina lost the connection. Ah, okay. <laughs> so she's not there anymore. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, I can see if everybody else, uh, if somebody else have questions. Carla, can I make yeah. a comment? Yeah, sure. Okay, yes, maybe yeah. just because you mentioned Carnauba, so uh, yeah, go ahead. just to, to just a few comments, I don't know, because we may have some time. So just some comments, uh, because Carla mentioned the Carnauba beam line, I'm, I am one of the scientists from the Carnauba beam line. So as Ricardo mentioned, we're gonna have more uh, spectroscopy capabilities, let's put it that way. So we're gonna have some, together with, uh, of course, uh, monochromatic beams that you can uh, select the energy. You, we also gonna have like spect uh, fluorescence detectors. So the idea is that you could do, do more spectroscopy in that sense too. And about the Brago tachography, uh, we would love to do it. We, kind of uh, are trying to prepare ourselves for that. And, but it's still a very challenging uh, technique. So uh, we probably gonna have the, the proper instrumentation in a sense that we can have uh, diffractions, I think up to 30, to theta. Uh, I don't remember exactly the number, but at two theta degree, something like that. Uh, so we're gonna be able to move our detector in that direction. So yeah, but the algorithms, is it still very uh, hard? So if someone would like to help us in the near future, that would be great. <laughs> so I have a quick, quick, quick question. Uh, yeah, and well, one comment that we are a bit working also on this spectro tachography, Carlos, and maybe there is points of, of collaborating uh, or sharing methods with this. Once you are uh, doing tachography and tomography already, and then... Yeah. Um, so my, my question was, uh, you had, I think in both beamlines, a very special design for the monochromators that had super high uh, stability uh, specifications. And I was wondering how did they turn out now that they have seen the x-rays, are they up to spec? Well, uh, you mentioned probably the double crystal monochromator, right? Yeah. That was yeah. The, 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 yeah, the, 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 the one that we developed ourselves. Uh, you know, you kind of, yeah, a new concept. We, uh, they are working, <laughs> as I said. The only thing is that because we don't have that much flux because we are working on lower current, so we are gradually humping up uh, the current that we have. We kind of have the same results that we, we had on the previous um, characterization that we made on the previous source. Because we kind of, uh, depends on the day, if you have more or more, more or less uh, electrons on the, on the, inside the ring. So, but we are 
not much than not more than one order of magnitude from what we got before, but just because we're gradually ramping up. And every time we have to, to commission a new beam line, we usually push the, the, the current down so that we uh, don't uh, have much trouble commissioning the the the, the, the initial hutch. So it's a kind of compromise. It is in the in the, the expect. Uh, it, it is what we expect, but still not uh, the full potential because we don't have the the, 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 the flux for that. Not not and have, not everything is so stable so, so that we can uh, really assure that we can test it properly. But so far so good. Let's put it that way. Thanks. So I lost the connection for some for. Um, Panicky minute, but I'm back. Um, um, question and, and comments. I think we can just uh, maybe close the official session, but whoever wants to stay longer to chat and linger uh, is welcome. I think this is a nice opportunity also to exchange across the globe um, and maybe to ask help and support for commissioning for Brack Tychography, for example, Virginie, or for CDI, for example, Ian. Uh, I think this is. These are nice opportunities also to, to get in touch and maybe to set first bridges for eventual collaborations or future experiments and test. Well, I, I, I think it... If I could just add to what Manuel just said, uh, I, I was also very impressed with the design of the double crystal monochromature and I would be very curious to see how that, how that, does, uh, that does work out in the long run. It, it was a very beautiful design and uh, uh, it should work well, but uh, um, you know, it's some, sometimes it takes a while to debug these things. And yes, of course, we will all be happy to uh, share notes on on uh, how how to do coherence experiments and so forth. But ultimately, uh, it will be important to build a user community. So we need to we need to, all of us need to. Um, work with the biologists and the chemists and the uh, earth scientists and people that, that can use these, uh, use these techniques. I have a comment to Carla. Uh, this is Salvador from Alba. I well, see. first of all, you, the talk was beautiful. I really enjoyed it. I think Thank that you. in one of your slides, you mentioned that you had 10 to the 13 coherent photons. Yes. Is that so? That's, it, it seems a little bit exaggerated to me. Eh? How did you get, <laughs> how did you get it, this number? No, no, this, this is, no, this is what, uh, uh, yeah, I, I know where you, you're talking about, about the Caterete being lining the table that I showed. Uh, this is actually, we didn't, like I said, we didn't measure it yet. This is based on simulation. So working at 3KV that we would get this. But now gets, uh, especially because we are looking to work between uh, 6 and 10KV. So probably, of course, that the, the flux is, is going to decrease. But we still, this is based on simulation, but we still need to, to characterize. But I mean... Uh, this is this is the the as far as I understood uh, and and Carlos can even correct me. I guess this is one of the main the main issues about using the the undulators that we are going to use, especially the the delta undulators that we are going to to replace soon. So we are using the Kim that emissioning. Then we are going to put the 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 delta undulators. So I guess this is the 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 beauty of the thing of this this delta is to take advantage of this high flux. Uh, I mean, more more um, uh, let's say um, specific uh, things. I, I really don't understand. But this is I really don't understand. No, but it, this is hard. That it's something that it's it's a bit different for me. But uh, what I know is that uh, yes, the flux is going to be very high. Maybe not 10 to the 13, but uh, uh, something similar. So you mean that the coherent fraction is going to be close to one at 3K? Yeah, this, this, yeah, this is this. Yeah, this is what. Maybe, no? Yeah, yeah. This is what we we at least based on calculate the on simulations. This is what we okay, estimated. That's very impressive. 
So what is the nominal current uh, for Sirius, the target? Uh, so the target is 350 milliamp. And now we are, I think the maximum that we reach uh, is 50 milliamp, I think the machine people. But for experiment, I think it went up to 40 milliamp. Okay. So your calculation are done at 350 milliamp. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, maybe I, I can take a couple of minutes to, to say something. Um, hi, Carla. Um, I, I was asking about the bright typography questions uh, a little bit previously, thanks to Dina. And uh, I, I just want to mention that we have been uh, developing recently some very nice uh, sample for uh, checking and uh, Im improving or testing bright typography, and they, they can be... Uh, they can be sent uh, if, if needed, if you are, whenever you will try to, to go to the bright typography uh, direction. So these are kind of seven star, but crystalline ones. So they, they, are, they are very, they are useful to check the, the, the possibilities of the bright typographic reconstruction and so on. Thank you. This is really nice. We will, for sure we are desperate uh, uh, after uh, standards. So thank yeah. you very much. And then we will contact you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. I also had another question for uh, both Carla and Carlos. Uh, you were mentioning that there is a big group of people uh, dedicated to imaging analysis, only to imaging or just to data, general data, data blocks. Uh, I, I guess the maybe Carlos can correct me, but uh, for now in the status that we are, uh, where we are tackling this part of imaging, they are, I, I would say that a big part of the group is dedicated to imaging process, uh, imaging rec uh, reconstruction and processing. Uh, so, but I mean, in principle, they are dedicated to all of the serious data is just that in the phase that we are now, since imaging is the focus and it, it takes a lot of, it, it is very different from what we use it to do in, at UVX. So basically we just had one, uh, one beam line of imaging. And now we have, I mean, most of the ones that we are starting now, they are. So I guess that's why most of the people, they are, they are dedicated to imaging right now, but they should be for all of the, 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 the techniques, right? Carlos, is it? Yeah, yeah, or? no, because it's the most data intensive uh, that we have in a sense that when we say imaging, we always work on 3D imaging, right? So... So the, the amount of data is, is very uh, expressive in that sense. But we, we already, uh, from what I remember, for example, they are already working with the guys, the, with the people from the Manaka beam line, which did crystallography beam line, in a sense that we, they are always already pushing for trying to optimize uh, and um, automate as much as they can in terms of uh, data process for crystallography, for example. So I guess... Uh, as the beam lines are starting to, to, to get uh, online, of course, they're going to provide much more assistance uh, to more specific uh, techniques in that sense, right? But because some of those techniques already have some tools, uh, because, well, CDI, we, we do have algorithm for that, but we don't have such a standardized tools and most of the things are homebrewed and everything. So also that's, I think it's one of the reasons why we are also, always go, uh, also going for this uh, imaging because those are homebrew uh, machine, homebrew tools that we have to do it. For the crystallography, for example, I know that they use some already standard uh, software. So it's a, that's the thing. So that's why we have this more into the development of those tools regarding that, but also trying to make what we know that the community used to make it work uh, in that sense. So Carla was mentioning the develop the in-house development, but we also have that one to make it work because we have such a, uh, for us, it's such a new and such a huge uh, computational power now that we are now to make it, making it work uh, properly. Yeah, I think from the point of view of the beam line, this is the risks to be a little bit underestimated. Um, so the, the, the amount of work that is needed even just to pull out an image from a 2D detector and put it out 
on the desk while you're doing the experiment. And then, you know, the second level is highlighting the part of the diffraction scattering signal that you need and uh, analyze it or process it. Or if you're doing any scanning experiment or whatever type you wanna, uh, you wanna make a map of, of, of that, um, you know, that feature in reciprocal space. Uh, so that's very important. So it's, it was quite, I was quite impressed there to say, to, to hear that you have a team of people working on that. That's good. This is absolutely good. Uh, we know that it's, it's fundamental to have online capabilities, uh, even just sorting the data, just to have an idea, and then eventually also analyze them. That, that, that's going to make the power ultimately. Great. So, well, I thank you so much for staying so long.